I wrote a little speech and gave a speech right before I left Congress. And I said, I don't think the members of Congress uh, really know how little effect they have in controlling things. Really, there's, uh, the, and that means that the Congress itself doesn't have much control. The people doesn't have much. To, they don't have much to say about it either. The control of overall policy is really in the hands of a very small number of people who control all the administrations, all the appointments to cabinets, and certainly all the appointments to the Federal Reserve. So the American people have been conditioned that it's great to have two parties. We don't want to be like Italy where there's all these choices. We want to limit our choices. It's easier that way. And we don't want to be like the Soviet Union where there's only one party. Yeah, that's right. So they have two. But if policies never change, what's the difference? So we do have one party. There's policies never change. And it came up even in the Contra hearings uh, that there were emergency powers written. As a matter of fact, that great hero Oliver North was in participating in designing some of these to literally, if necessary, suspend the Constitution. Former Congressman Ron Paul was the ranking Republican on the House Banking and Currency Committee, where he had a bird's eye view of the economic functioning of the American power structure. We'll talk to him shortly on Alternative Views. We're going to go deeply into the American power structure, particularly from the economic aspect. We're going to find out how our economic system is controlled. We have with us uh, two people who know a lot about it, particularly Ron Paul, who's a libertarian candidate for president of the United States right now. He's been in Congress. He was elected four times from Houston, and he served on the House Banking and Currency Committee. So he had a real bird's eye view of just how the US economic system works. And joining us on our discussion is John Cohn, an Austinite who's with the Citizens for a Return to Constitutional Government. He and his group have been studying a lot about the Federal Reserve System, how it got here, and the general overall framework of our power structure, particularly from the economic point of view. But before we have our interview with Ron Paul, let's take a look at some of the publications from the alternative press and see what the establishment media haven't been presenting to you. Last night on Monday, October the 3rd, CBS News had a report that almost as an aside revealed a sensational story that might blow the 1988 election all over. What happened was that in Lebanon, one of the American hostages that had been held for something like 18 months was released, starting speculation that there was going to be a release of a lot of American hostages before the election that might help Bush win the election. Well, after giving the details of this story, then CBS News gave information about a news report in a French magazine and newspaper that indicated that high officials of the Bush campaign had been negotiating with the Iranians to try to get them to pressure the Lebanon allies of theirs to release all of the hostages that, again, would supposedly be a big coup for the Reagan-Bush administration and would help create good feelings that might help win the election for Bush. The Bush campaign vehemently denies it, and today the New York Times, in an article on this uh, story, didn't really make any allegations about the Bush campaign and its possible connections to the Iranians. However, they indicated a parallel to a story that was going on in 1980 when Jimmy Carter was running against Ronald Reagan that might have sensational implications for the election. And that is, they said that the hostage release now of the American hostages that are held in Lebanon raises the possibility of an October surprise in the presidential campaign 
parallel to the fears that the Reagan team had in 1980 when they were running against Carter that in 1980 a negotiation would take place between the Carter administration and the Iranians to release the hostages that would win a lot of support and goodwill for Carter and thus help him perhaps uh, win the uh, election against Reagan. Well, this is a sensational story because as we've reported on alternative views and as the nation, Playboy, In These Times and other national newspapers and magazines have reported, there's been a lot of speculation that in 1980, the Reagan team made a deal with the Iranians to make sure that the American hostages were not released until after the presidential election that helped Reagan beat Carter. The first source of this story was an insider in the Reagan campaign, a woman who said that there was great happiness in the Reagan campaign in 1980 when revelations broke in the office that Dick Allen, who was one of the main people in the Reagan election team, who later became the national security uh, administrator, that Allen had cut a deal with the Iranians to make sure that the hostages were not released. This story was later confirmed by the president of Iran at the time, Bani Sadar, who is now in uh, exile, and who said, yes, some of the Ayatollahs cut a deal with the Reagan administration team, and that the deal was that if the, the Iranians kept the hostages until after the election, then there would, uh, the Americans would illegally give the Iranians spare parts and weapons for their fight with the Iraqis in the Iran-Iraqi war. This would, of course, constitute uh, treason, this negotiation of the Reagan team with a foreign government before the um, election. Well, despite the sensational allegations, despite the fact that during the Democratic Convention, President, former President Jimmy Carter, when asked this question on a talk show, if he'd heard rumors that the Reagan administration or the Reagan election team had cut a deal, with the Iranians to hold the hostages. Carter said yes, he'd heard this story. Yes, he'd discussed this with former Iranian officials. Yes, he believed that it happened. Still, this story was not taken up by the national uh, news media and has yet to uh, break. This is particularly surprising because in the October Playboy, there was a sensational article by uh, Abby Hoffman that detailed this whole 1980 uh, October surprise uh, story. We might recall that when Playboy revealed Jessica Hahn's sexual escapades with Jim Baker, this was splashed all over the national media and did Baker in. But yet no uh, revelations have come in the national media concerning this story. There's been no investigation. And in these times called up spokespeople for ABC, CBS, and NBC and all three networks said they had no plans to investigate this story. They had, uh, they, some of them had heard about it, but for some reason it's too hot for the networks to go into. A spokesperson for AB, NB, ABC's uh, Nightline said that they also were not planning to cover it, and only CB, uh, the cable news networks, talk uh, show host Larry King said that he was interested in uh, pursuing this. This story would perhaps be particularly damaging for Bush because according to the Playboy article, it was when Bush got on the Reagan election campaign team in 1980 after he was named by Reagan as vice president that the Reagan campaign started getting all sorts of intelligence information from the Carter administration um, agencies, the State Department, the Pentagon, the CIA concerning the plans to release the Iranian hostages, the negotiations, the logistics of the uh, situation. So Bush, if this story is correct, was involved in this attempt to uh, negotiate a deal with the um, Iranians uh, that um, um, allegedly actually uh, took place and helped win the election for uh, Reagan. So Frank, it'll be interesting to see if this story finally breaks in the uh, mainstream uh, media because Again, all of these alternative media, including uh, Playboy, have played this story up, but it has yet to, even the New York Times hasn't touched uh, the story. Times, Newsweek, all three uh, networks are just letting uh, Bush and uh, the Reagan administration off the hook on this one.
Well, it amounts to a coup, really. Yeah, I mean, it's a coup that the Reagan administration uh, or the Reagan team, before they actually won the election, were negotiating with foreign heads of uh, government, and that they'd infiltrated all the U.S. intelligence agencies to get up-to-date information as to what kinds of negotiations yeah. were going on with the Iranians to release uh, the hostages. In these times reports also that a group of the former hostages are planning on suing the Reagan administration for uh, keeping them oh. <laughs> in, in captivity there for three more uh, months. But they said that this would be an expensive, long, difficult um, lawsuit, and it's not clear that this is going to take off. But again, rumors are starting to circulate about this event, which again have been kept off the election coverage uh, so far. And with great interest, we will watch to see if it breaks or doesn't break. That's all the time we have for news right now. Let's turn to our interview with Ron Paul, former congressman, and talk about the American power structure. We're joined by John Cohn. Ron, there's an old statement I've read and heard about people saying in Congress, the banks never lose. Well, I think that's a general statement. I think the big bankers never lose. But I think a little banker right now is losing a lot because a lot of little bankers are getting closed down and the big banks are gobbling them up. I don't think David Rockefeller is going to lose. I don't think he's going to be out selling uh, apples or pushing pencils anytime soon. But a lot of bankers uh, that are being wiped out at the state level uh, are losing. But the big banking power structure seems to have control because they're on the inside and they have control of money and they know what policy is going to be down the road. Can you specify this structure, this, you're talking about this power structure? Well, the power structure basically is made up of a lot of very powerful business and uh, corporate leaders uh, in the country. And uh, it's, uh, in particular, they have formed their organizations. They've been around for a good while, and uh, they don't even hide it anymore. You know, the Trilaterals Committee Commission, as well as the Council of Foreign Relations. No matter what, uh, which president, which party is in power, uh, they will appoint to the major offices uh, members of these two committees. And uh, they're always, they, they always have control of the Federal Reserve System. So the Wall Streeters, the big bankers, have inside information as far as what is happening and what's going on. And uh, control over money is pretty significant because if you can control money, you're really controlling one half of every single transaction. So that is a tremendous amount of power. But uh, it doesn't look like we're going to have any independence. Uh, they say the Federal Reserve is independent, but that's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, uh, the protection that the founders gave us to try to keep us from this happening uh, never authorized the central bank, and they were very strict in the writing of the Constitution to limit the power of Congress to only to the minting of gold coins, to allowing only gold and silver to be legal tender, and prohibiting the printing of paper money. All those things we have failed to follow. And that's why we have a central bank with a paper money system and a lot of inflation, high interest rates, and a very, very shaky economy. So I would say that if we would have followed the advice of the Founding Fathers and not allowed this power structure, this group of elitist bankers and industrialists to get control not only of the banking system and the monetary system, but really our foreign policy and our government. I wrote a little speech and gave a speech right before I left Congress. Congress, and I said, I don't think the members of Congress uh, really know how little effect they have in controlling things. Really, there's, uh, the, and that means that the Congress itself doesn't have much control. The people doesn't have much. To, they don't have much to say about it either. The control of overall policy is really in the hands of a very small number of people who control all the administrations, all the appointments to cabinets, and certainly all the appointments to the Federal Reserve. Well, that shows we have a single party political system in the United States, just maybe split in two a little bit, but there's it's really a no It's a single party, and if you look at the obstacles put in our way as libertarians to get on, on ballots, it's, it's an outrage because we have to spend uh, more than a third of our energies and our monies just to apply to get on, ba on state ballots, and, uh, and this uh, distracts us. Some states it's almost impossible to get on. They say, and I have not personally investigated every law around the world, but they say that we are one of the toughest countries in the world to get a new party system. And the American people have been conditioned that it's great to have two parties. We don't want to be like Italy where there's all these choices. We want to limit our choices. It's easier that way. And we don't want to be like the Soviet Union where there's only one party. Yeah, that's right. So they have two. 
But if policies never change, what's the difference? So we do have one party. There's policies never change. You know, if, if there would have been a difference, uh, maybe under the Republicans we would have had a uh, closer to a balanced budget, but the deficits were worse with the Republicans. But foreign policy, the policy of intervention, subsidizing communism and uh, helping rich allies, that always continues Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it was the same policy, Republican or Democrat, that supported uh, wars like Korea and Vietnam and the CIA operations and the FBI. All these operations are endorsed by the, by the other two parties. But uh, and that, for that reason, what do they do? They get control of the funding as well. The other two parties get over a hundred million dollars handed to them. You know, not too long ago, we had the two conventions on national television, Republican Democratic Convention. And the American people didn't watch. They should have. They paid for it. They paid nine million dollars. We as citizens were forced to pay to run those conventions, nine million dollars a piece, and therefore they get all this exposure, making it again very difficult for an option, a third option, to be heard. It's uh, very hard to get our message out. Uh, but the control is there, whether it's in the political control or the banking control or in government policy control in the administrations. I want to touch, if I may, just on your comment a moment ago about uh, the, the parting speech that you left with your colleagues in Congress. Now, you were there for four terms and uh, I think are aware of the general level of awareness of your colleagues in Congress at that time. Do they really not know that, uh, that all of this is going on, that the power structure is there, uh, unseen but really manipulated? The strings. Most of them don't know. Most of them are suspicious that there are the problems are more serious than they would never ever uh, admit publicly. But they don't understand the policies. Uh, I've had a lot of members on the banking committee come up and ask me questions. How does the Federal Reserve System work? What are special drawing rights? How? What is the IMF? And they'll do that quietly because they haven't uh, really studied it. Uh, so most of them are naive, but very much aware that there's some serious uh, problems. But if you get uh, somebody at the head of a committee that's been around for 30 years or so, uh, I think that they know very much what's happening. Uh, they're very much attuned to what's happening, and I don't think they get that far. I don't think they get to head of a committee unless they've uh, more or less been accepted, uh, uh, you know, by the power structure. I did a study uh, or just a quick look uh, a few years ago after reading the uh, Joint Economic Report of the Joint Economic Committee in Congress. And reading it, it looked like it came right out of the Trilateral Commission. It looked all the little buzzwords that the Trilateral Commission reports had, all the things that the Trilateral Commission wanted. That, and so I looked to see if, in the memberships of organizations of these the congressmen and uh, senators, and sure enough, almost every one of them had, or a member of Trilateral Commission or Bilderberger or Council on Foreign Relations. I, I can remember having a conversation with Barbara Conable one day. Yeah, he's a biggie in the power. And structure. he was he was complaining about you know there's people always complaining about me belonging to the Trilateral Commission. He was complaining to me and. Uh, Lo and behold, it was Barbara Conable, but uh, as soon as he resigned from Congress, where did he end up? The head of the World Bank. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I left Congress. I studied the banking system. I understand something about the money. They haven't called me yet for one of those appointments. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've been waiting at the telephone, waiting for them to appoint me. <laughs> well, John, you've studied a lot on this uh, uh, banking industry structure, and uh, it's not only interlocked here, but there are international interlocks, aren't there? Yes, there are, and uh, the ties with the foreign banking interest. Uh, we, uh, the people that settled this country and left, uh, of course, Europe came over here and settled down, and <clears throat> almost immediately, the uh, the powers that be in the European continent and the money circles were reaching out those tentacles to gain control of the uh, new country here, and that struggle has continued. We see it, and who shall control our currency? Uh, they struggled back between you know, Jefferson. And as a matter of fact, I have a, a quote from. Jefferson that I think is very pertinent to our discussion here. If the American people ever allow the banks to control the issuance of their currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers occupy. So he warned us that far uh, ago, and here we are, and his, what he said is coming true. Yes, and, and his side certainly won the fight back then. They got the right position in the Constitution. They had the debate over the money issue. Uh, the hard money people uh, won. The Federalists uh, lost. The uh, Hamiltonians lost. Uh, 
but then subsequently it's been downhill and certainly in this century it never happens at one time you know it isn't all or nothing they keep chipping even, away yes. even though we got our central bank in 1913 it wasn't the total destruction of the system it literally took from 1913 to 1971 uh, to open up the floodgates, but it was in 71 that uh, the last linkage to gold occurred. Of course, in the 60s, there was still some linkage to silver. But since 71, all you have to do is look at the economic record of spending and deficits and all the economic problems and interest rates and all the price increases. I mean, it's just been totally out of control. And uh, then uh, even in 1980, there was another law that increased tremendously the uh, power Credit of the Federal Reserve. Credit unions and the savings loans. Yeah, the most significant increase in uh, power to the Federal Reserve System occurred since 1913 was in 1980, further enhancing and getting more power uh, into the Federal Reserve. This was a time when they introduced this idea that we uh, could use anything, or the Federal Reserve could use anything as an asset to collateralize our Federal Reserve note. See, in the old days, you'd have gold and silver as collateral to issue a note, which isn't uh, too bad. You know, it's collateral, and it would restrict the monetary authorities, and it would be a certificate. You know, it would be a guaranteed certificate. But it was then that they changed it to say that you could use any asset, even a foreign bond. So it's true now that you can use, and they have, use foreign bonds, they put them in the Federal Reserve, and that's the backing. That's the collateral for our Federal Reserve. Now, that's how strong our currency is. You wonder how the currency works. It doesn't deserve to work. And someday the people are going to wake up and realize the money's worthless, and that's when you're going to have runaway inflation. Today we just have gradual, steady inflation, depreciation of the money, causing a lot of harm and, and suffering. But one day we're, the country's going to wake up and there's going to be a catastrophe. I want to focus on the, on the Federal Reserve itself uh, for a moment in that I wonder, you know, what percentage of the people know that the Federal Reserve is not really a part of the government, a privately owned corporation, and who owns that you know the Federal Reserve well could you have a comment on that well I think very few people understand how it works uh, because the members of Congress weren't uh, really mu uh, very much aware of it but I think it's a little bit worse than just saying it's private you know if it were just private uh, they'd have to live within the laws of the land open the fraud and yes. they would have to uh, be a public corporation and you know if open their there's books. a public corporation you have a right to know what your corporation is doing if you own stock and be here, audited here yeah. it's secret but where do they get their power is it the power of the marketplace that creates this corporation no they in addition to being very secretive have their authorization their creation from government so the government creates them and they create a special thing so it's much worse than just being a private corporation it is a very secretive private government ordained corporation that has the power to counterfeit money. So it's very, very unique and much worse than just being private. It's the secrecy of it and the power that it gets through government legislation that makes it so evil. Now you were the ranking Republican on the House Banking Committee for a while. On House one of the subcommittees, subcommittees, but not on the entire committee. And do I understand correctly that members of Congress are, can't even go to the Fed meetings? That's can right. I was very interested in the issue, and I was on three subcommittees, two being on coinage and domestic monetary policy subcommittee, but I could not go to a meeting. I couldn't get an audit. I couldn't even check the books. And they're the ones who create the money. Mm -hmm. uh, yet I, was, I felt like I was elected to be responsible to the people when I would be inquisitive and looking into these things. Their attitude is, when you need to know or when the people need to know, we'll tell you. They're in charge and we're just on the outside looking in rather than the people being in charge of the government sending me or somebody else as their congressman to control the bureaucrats. But it's turned upside down. They have control and they allow us to know what we want and what they think we should know. Now, what does the Federal Reserve System actually do? I have so many people say, you know, I see this and uh, the Federal Reserve, I don't know what the Federal Reserve Bank does, and why is it so significant? Well, it, it does several things. One of the benign things it does, and in some ways um, efficiently, and that is they exchange checks. You know, they're a, a, an exchange bureau, but that could be done very easily privately. The real evil that they do is they create money and credit. If the federal government runs up a debt, and they tend to have a habit of doing this, uh, you know, and Congress is, you know, run by Republicans and Democrats, so they all spend money, they run up the debt. Of course, they, uh, when they spend, they have to tax us. If they can't tax enough, then they have to borrow. And if they can't borrow enough, then they have one other option. They can tax and borrow, inflate, inflate. 
The most important thing to remember is inflating is not the prices. In, the prices go up after the money is inflated and the money loses its value. So the Fed is designed to accommodate the politician in a very secretive manner. The politicians spend the money because the special interest is going to say, we want this, we want this. The politician gets reelected, so he's rewarded. And the tax becomes an indirect tax. Instead of going directly to the people, what, we, what the Federal Reserve does is they can take a Treasury bill, accept the Treasury bill, which now is just a mere computer entry. They accept the Treasury bill of $10 billion. And they give Treasury $10 billion in their checking account. Where did the Federal Reserve get the money? right out of thin air, right from heaven. They create the money, they put it in the checking account, and the treasury spends it. And then that means that the people who got that money immediately get to spend it, and it has value. But as it circulates in the economy, the value of the purchasing power of the money goes down, and you have prices going up. The, the, the bad part about this is not everybody suffers equally. If the money supply went up 10%, and every one of us had the cost of living go up identically 10%, it wouldn't be nearly the great harm, but because of the system, it's designed literally to benefit the politicians and the bankers and big corporations, those who get the money. They get the money, they get the benefit, and then somebody else in a year or two or three suffers the consequences. Now we read about the Federal Reserve as a banker's bank and uh, we see them that they raise the discount rate or they increase the money supply. What do all these things mean? Well, the banker's bank means literally that the bankers are required to put their deposits in the Federal Reserve System and they're accountable to the Federal Reserve System. They have to send in the reports to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve has all these regulations and rules, so uh, they control the whole entire banking system. If uh, in, the, the, in their efforts to fine tune, although they literally destroy the money, they don't want to destroy the money. They want to control things so when inflation gets perking along, they're aware of the same economic uh, thoughts that I'm aware of, and they know that if they're not a little bit cautious about this, uh, they could have, you know, runaway inflation. So they tend to back off. But they benefit from the backing off. That means they tighten the credit, raise the interest rates, and cause a recession. And they do it in the name of saving the economy, which they have to or the currency gets out of control. But if they know it's coming, then they benefit on it too. Then they benefit, they know then to be in cash and earn high interest rates and the banks benefit by it. So they, whether the economy is going up or down, if they're designing the policy, they can, they can catch the swing. So it's the inside information they, that they have. But if they didn't give the recessions, which are literally the results of the inflation, the system would crumble much faster. But our argument as hard money people is that in spite of their arrogance to think that they can keep this going forever, and as powerful as they are, the market is more powerful. See, for decades they kept the gold price at $35 an ounce. They said, we will regulate the price of gold. But they kept printing the money. The market finally broke down the price of gold. Well, the marketplace will finally uh, win out and the people will wake up and say, it's all a paper, it's all a scam. And that's when there's chaos and that's when the bankers realize they're getting out of control and that's when the connection of the bankers to the politicians is critical because then power is threatened. So that's when they, then they come down with political controls of our lives. That's why the emergency powers are already written. The president can declare an emergency and take over the industries and take over our lives and confiscate the gold. And that's why we should be concerned. We should be concerned for, uh, you know, our prosperity, you know, our standard of living and all. But our greatest concern ought to be that when these crises come in the market, disrupts this political system and this monetary system, then we are threatened by political power taking away more of our personal liberties. Are this the FEMA regulations that you're talking about? The program? Yes, it's done under the FEMA, the emergency powers, and it came up even in the Contra hearings uh, that there were emergency powers written. As a matter of fact, that great hero Oliver North was in participating in designing some of these to literally, if necessary, suspend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things they're talking about. I don't know if you recall... Set up when concentration camps. So. This was brought up in the FEMA, in the Iran-Contra hearings, remember? They yeah. immediately suppressed Stopped. it, yes. and they say, this is something we can't discuss in National the open. Security, yes. the people aren't allowed to know about this. Yeah. And that's why, who, who protected uh, this information? Who protected Oliver North? The head Democrat, which goes to show you the power structure is the same. Uh, John, you made a big study of the history of the uh, Federal Reserve. How did it come about? 
Well, it's a murky story, and uh, I think that maybe 1913 ought to be the year that went down in infamy in American history because not only did we get uh, just barely in 1913 uh, the Federal Reserve, we also got the income tax in that very same year, and those two things have worked to our uh, uh, really uh, been a very negative thing in our society and in our economy ever since that time. But it was a very secretive thing. It really goes back to uh, the bankers getting in a sealed railway car and sneaking off to Jekyll Island, Georgia. And it was a very secret meeting. In fact, they called it the First Name Club. They only called each other by their first name so that even people who worked there as uh, waiters and servants and so forth later couldn't identify for sure who had even participated in that meeting. Well, it was and only about four or five people, wasn't it? Well, it was about 10, I believe, or, 10 or, or, or 12. And that group of people literally uh, laid the basis for what became the, the Federal Reserve. Basically, Rockefeller, Morgan people? Those, that group, uh, you probably know something in that area Colonel of Colonel House was, there. was involved uh, there, yes. and the Woodrow Wilson uh, people were there, although this occurred, I believe, in 1910 or so when they met Jekyll at Jekyll Island. Yes, that's right. There. It was a couple of years uh, later. By the time it got planned, it was finally passed in 1913. It was kind of sneaked through Congress, and uh, Wilson actually signed that into law, the Federal Reserve Act, like two days before Christmas. And when many of the senators and congressmen, of course, with transportation in 1913 being what it was, they had long since left the nation capital, many of them. But the ones that they wanted to stay and vote did stay and vote. Wilson signed the law uh, two days before Christmas. And traditionally, hasn't that been a period where, by gentlemen's agreement, that important legislation is not enacted right around the Christmas holiday? It may be a gentleman's agreement, but that's generally the time that I was always most vigilant because I realized that's when most of the garbage <laughs> would be passed and most of the more honest. You know, on the last day of the session is unbelievable. Stacks and stacks of pieces of legislation come in, and nobody reads anything. So the worst things happen at that particular time. But it is supposed to be that if the members aren't attending, that they wouldn't be doing these kind of things. But uh, you're absolutely right. There was a very low attendance, and and. Uh, it was, uh, it was an unusual year because generally Congress didn't meet that late in the year. And I don't know whether they were called back in the session or what, but it was unusual for Congress back in those days. Now it's very common to meet all year round. And so back then they were usually only in session two or three months of the year. But here they were in session in December, very unusual year. And one of the most important pieces of legislation, certainly in our history, kind of just rushed through at the last minute without anyone really paying that much attention to it. And, uh, I think it's so interesting. There, there were a lot of people who weren't fooled. The, uh, a lot of the congressmen from the western part of the United States, even the south, more populous areas, weren't uh, fooled by what was happening. They recognized it as a gravy train going to the bankers, so uh, they naturally were opposed to it. And uh, in reading uh, the book Secret of the Federal Reserve, it, I thought it was fascinating that the bankers set up an organization to complain about this Federal Reserve uh, Act, which was there, they were secretly, which they secretly hatched up, and they were secretly uh, uh, trying to get passed, but they complained that it was going to kill them just so it would, uh, the people would think that, oh well, we're going to pass this and it'll harness the banks. Yet they were literally getting a license to steal because that uh, really permitted this fractional reserve banking system to occur where they can pyramid their deposits, loan out money that they don't even have. So it was a tremendous benefit to the bankers. You know, nothing of this that you'll, you'll find in uh, history books or books on government or the economic history of the United States. Nothing about how this no, came we're about. We're certainly not teaching it in school. Not, in, in, history public, classes. not in the public schools. Hopefully we will see that it gets taught somewhere. Let's come forward from 1913 to the Depression era and the role that the Fed played in that, the inflation-deflation cycle. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, a lot of people, uh, and you can still find in history books, that uh, the economists were reassured in the 1920s that there was no inflation. Prices were relatively stable, and they always uh, said that inflation was rising prices. But if you look at the monetary history, there was a lot of monetary inflation during the 1920s, and the money, instead of going into production, it went into speculation. Of course, it bid up the price of stocks and real estate, and then it finally came to that time when uh, there is concern or they make the decision, look, I think we think we can not only save the dollar and stop the inflation, but we can make some money on it. They say, we're going to have to turn this off, so they cut back on the credit, and it caused the stock market crash. And of course, then the Great Depression followed. Uh, the inf previous inflation always leads to a correction of a, of, a, of a recession or depression. 
But if you compare what happened in the 1920s, very similar to what's happening here in the 1980s. And you just think about how many times you read in the last six or eight years that the government's told us there's nothing to worry about, there's no inflation. Well, there's been a greater expansion of money now than there was in the 20s. Of course, there was a greater speculation in the stock market and a bigger stock market crash. So I anticipate, and many Austrian free market economists anticipate, that the recession that's coming will not be a recession at all. It'll be a depression and probably be bigger than the one we had in the 1930s because it will be the correction for all the malinvestment, all the mistakes made because of this artificial credit pumped in by the Federal Reserve System. So we have to look for the correction. The next president will be blamed for the depression, but it is that they shouldn't get to blame. It should be the Federal Reserve policy and the Reagan administration and the Congress today who have run up the debts and created the new money that has set the stage for the next recession. The next recession or slant depression, if it becomes that, do you have a, an idea in mind for when that might begin? I, we see all these books out now, the Great Depression of 1990. And I have an idea, but the most important thing about Austrian economics is that you cannot project precisely because events occur with emotional aspects, human beings making decisions. That's why, uh, although many, including myself, kept saying there's going to be a stock market, but I didn't know it was going to be October 19th. It could have been October 10th or it could have been November 15th. I mean, it comes when people just get frightened and scared and panic. Uh, so Austrian economics teaches that, yes, we know a depression is coming. But we don't know the day it's going to start. But still, a lot of people say, well, what do you think? Because uh, you just have to uh, make a judgment for personal and financial reasons. I think it's going to, there's going to be another major financial event before the end of this year, close to the election, more likely before than afterwards. And that by next year, next spring, it'll be very clear that this country is moving rapidly into a recession. We put that question to Congressman Gonzalez, your uh, uh, former colleague on the Housing Banking uh, Currency Committee. And I said, uh, well, I've been reading a lot about uh, how the next president is going to be the next Herbert Hoover. And he said, if we're lucky, the Depression will wait that long. Yeah, and I wouldn't argue a whole lot, uh, but, <laughs> but time is running short. Here we are in uh, August already, and uh, um, a recession could start tomorrow or the next day. It could be very clear. I think, matter of fact, the standard of living has been going down. I think history is going to show that uh, the country has been down on the down slope maybe for the past 10 years. It's just not going rapidly and it's not confirmed by the government statistics, but they're changing all the time. They use GNP figures to reassure us everything is okay and 40% of the GNP is government spending and where do they get the money? They print it. And uh, also, uh, you know, like for CPI, they change in that. If it's going up too fast, they change the way they calculate it. But if you go to the average guy on the street and say, is your cost of living going up? He says, I can't even pay my bills. I'm not even buying steak anymore. And uh, so things are a lot worse than the government leads to believe. Can we get back to this matter of political power, econ economic power, and control of the economy? Uh, were you in Congress when Wright Patman was still there? No, but I was in Congress when his son was there. Okay. I think it's Bill Patman that uh, was there, but uh, I didn't know Wright Patman. Wright Patman, of course, was the chairman of the banking committee right. at one time, and he had some good ideas about the Federal Reserve. Oh, he had, uh, in my studies on the American power structure, it was a real gold mine because his committee, the one which you uh, came on later, made studies of how the uh, big banks in the United States control the uh, corporations in the United States, and it's incredible through interlocking directorates and stock ownership with they, I guess, uh, did you see much of this while you were there on the committee? Uh, not in the detail that he had looked at it, but it's obviously very clear. Uh, the one thing that I picked up from Wright Patman was his bill to audit the Federal Reserve, and I only made minor modifications to it. I dug that out, and, and he, of course, was a champion of uh, openness in government. He wanted to know what the Federal Reserve was doing, and he never, finally, I think in his older uh, years, they had voted him out of that power position. You know, even before he was out of Congress, he lost his position they put in Henry Royce who was much more controlled uh, by the uh, banking people but uh uh, he uh, he was a good person and he wanted more openness. I don't know if he was as strong on the gold standard as I am, but he certainly was against the type of banking system and how the how the banking system and the Federal Reserve serve the interests of the bankers and large corporations. Do the uh, bankers control the mass media the way they control other major industries in the United States? 
Probably so, and certainly a lot of people say that. I guess I hesitate only that I don't have, you know, the proof sitting in my hand, but I think it's very clear. I can see it in government, and I saw it in banking, and certainly it can't be surprising if they're involved with other large corporations why uh, the media wouldn't be very much involved, too. Uh, it would be more of a surprise to find that not to be the case, but I don't think I could take them into court right now and uh, give them that proof that is necessary. But I think those who have studied it uh, feel that that is the case. Can you see uh, this scenario, assume that you're elected president of the United States, you're sitting in the Oval Office, can you see yourself signing uh, a bill or a directive abolishing the Federal Reserve? Well, a lot would have to happen, you know, if um, if I went there and I was a libertarian president and the Congress remained the same and the spending was continuing and the people still wanted all this big government, no, I can't, I can't sign a bill because it wouldn't have been passed. Uh, in the first four years of a libertarian administration, I don't think we're going to achieve that unless we're picking up the pieces, <laughs> you know, and I don't want that to happen. I'd like to avoid the chaos, and that's uh, my goal, but if there's if there's an economic calamity and they look to the libertarians for solutions, then I think it's conceivable. But that would be more like being a prophet than uh, somebody running for president, you know. And, and I just don't know how this happen, will happen. Uh, but I do believe, though, if we continue to do what we're doing, continue to spend, run up the deficit, print the money, uh, I think we are going to have the crisis. But uh, right now, I'm terrified to think that the people in Washington aren't going to look to us for the answers. They're going to enforce these uh, emergency powers, and FEMA will be in, co in control, uh, not the American people. Can you, uh, did, did your committee uh, look into the matter of the uh, debt which foreign countries owe to the so-called U.S. banks? Yes, that's been and ongoing and certainly 1982 was a key year because there was a big bailout of Mexico and Argentina and Brazil in order to patch it together. And uh, they did everything illegal, just like it was illegally done, even admitted by Don Regan, who was Secretary of Treasury at the time. It was illegal on how they bailed out Continental of Illinois. And uh, they do whatever is necessary to keep the structure together, the system together. If big banks gobble up little banks, but nothing disintegrates. It's not like what was happening in the 1920s, 1930s. And uh, they'll do whatever is necessary. So that's what happened back in 1982. They work internationally, too. The Federal Reserve, the Treasury, the World Bank, Bank of International Settlements, which is the depositor for all the central banks. See, you have the Federal Reserve banks depositing in the Federal Reserve System, but the central banks of the United States and all the other countries use the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland to be the International's Bankers Bank. And they all got involved to keep the structure together, and they did. They restored order. That was back when gold went quickly from $300 up to $500 within a six-month period. But then they saw the, the market decide, oh, it looks like they're going to hold it together for a while longer, and they certainly have, at the expense of the American taxpayer and at the expense of the dollar. And of course, since then, the dollar's value has gone down 40, 50 percent in value of other currency. Prices continue to rise. But eventually, my argument is that the marketplace will overwhelm even those men of great power, and there will be a panic that the bankers won't be able to maintain. And then they will want to maintain their power, but not by, not by fine-tuning the economy, but then by the intimidation of political force. Uh, I noticed a uh, very little talked about thing that, uh, this is from the alternative press, where uh, the head of the Fed, Paul Volcker, got a little bill or a little sentence on a rider on a bill passed through Congress that if necessary, the foreign debt that these uh, third world countries to the U.S. banks would be monetarized, which is just a way of saying that the U.S. taxpayers would pay for it. Yes, this was part of that Monetary Control Act, and that means that if uh, the Fed can hold any asset, they can hold a foreign bond. They literally, under the law today, can buy a Mexican bond that's worthless, put it in the Federal Reserve, and then what monetize means is that it can be collateral for issuing credit, issuing Federal Reserve notes, and that will be considered an asset probably at face value. They're not going to deep, I mean, the bond isn't going to be worth anything, obviously, but they can monetize that. That is mean they will take it as an asset, create new money, and distribute the new money. Hmm. So that isn't a direct bailout by the taxpayers? It's, an in, it's, it's an indirect because what we do is we buy the Mexican bond. 
and then put the bond uh, in the Federal Reserve. But actually, it, it works twice because let's say the Mexican bond, there's a billion dollars worth of Mexican bonds down there. So the Fed says, well, we'll buy them. You need some hard cash. We'll buy your bond from you, and we give them the money, and they take that out of, out of the system, and they send it to them. But then when they take it's an asset, it becomes an asset to the Federal Reserve, and they say, ah, we have something we can back up our currency with. <laughs> so they take this worthless instrument that they paid for with fiat money, and then they put it in their assets, and then they create, use that to create more money. So they really monetize it twice, so to speak. How closely tied is the Federal Reserve System and the U.S. banking system with the European banking system, the Rothschild, et cetera? The international bankers are buddies, you know, and they're, they're closer together and they deal with policy outside most of the legislative institutions. Uh, the central bankers are more powerful than, say, the uh, congresses of the different countries. Uh, they have much more power, and therefore, through the Bank of International Settlement and the IMF and the World Bank, they have total control of this, and they have meetings where even the Secretary of the Treasury doesn't attend. It's strictly the bankers, the Federal Reserve and the Bundestag and all the other banks of the world. They get together and they make these plans and that's why they come up with the bailout systems, you know, if there's a banking crisis someplace. But uh, they, they will uh, do whatever they think is necessary by the creation of new credit. Right now they have made the agreement that they will create more of these special drawing rights, which is nothing more than credit instruments in the IMF. They create them out of thin air. They have a monetary value in all, based in all currencies, and they can give those to whomever needs them. And uh, they've just agreed to cre create $40 billion worth of new special drawing rights out of thin air. Hmm. Now, what then is the role of the IMF? It seems to me that the taxpayers' money goes to the IMF, they give it to the third world country, which in turn turns it back over to the banks. It looks like a... And a lot of it just goes directly from, uh, you know, the taxpayers directed to the bank. It never goes to the third world. It's all oh. by computer. <laughs> but that was, you know, a few years back, I guess it was 83, there was an IMF bailout. They were in financial trouble and it was $9 billion. Most of that money was necessary to pay interest, you know, just to the big banks. That's why the Panama Canal Treaty existed. Uh, but it was a banking deal, too. It was uh, Panama was having trouble making their payments to the banks, and they needed a better cash flow. The Canal Treaty occurred. They had more income. Now their uh, little or, old uh, Noriega isn't quite so obedient, and they're a little bit annoyed by it all. But, uh, you know, Trujillos and then Noriega were really the hand-picked people from our business banking industry. They had a banking haven down there. But now Noriega isn't uh, quite so obedient. It's making the bankers a little nervous. They'd like to get rid of them, and so far they haven't been able to. And I think one of the reasons is he has a lot of he has a lot of information that he is threatened with. And they said, if you ever get too close to us, we're going to let the world know exactly uh, how you've been dealing with us and subsidizing our drug trade. So I think he's doing a little blackmailing. People who have studied the drug trade say that if we're not for the collusion and uh, facilitation and laundering of money by the big banks, the drug trade wouldn't be able to operate. They'd have a great deal of difficulty because uh, they literally end up buying some of these banks and they own the banks and, and they do, uh, you know, filter their money through. Now there's a great pretense that there's going to be a lot of crackdown on all these drug dealers and this money coming in tonight and they're going to find out who it is. <laughs> but I think that's basically designed to use as an excuse, develop this hysteria against drugs so that they have currency controls on whom? On American citizens who finally wise up and say, hey, I can't preserve my wealth in this country. I'm going to put a couple Krugerrands over in the, over in the Swiss banks. So they try to take everybody, when near the time of runaway inflation, people want to take the money out of the country to preserve their wealth. And that's why they're doing, writing all these laws not to catch the drug dealers. I think that's just a, you know, a, a, you know, a front. I think the real reason is to have currency controls on the American citizens because once a large number of citizens decide to leave, just think of how many people in Mexico tried to come here when their banking crisis occurred. You know, the government clamped down. You can't take the money out. They still did. 
But we we had those uh, we had credit controls in the 1970s, currency controls, trying to keep people. Britain had them on, off and on, and they'll all they always resort to those kind of things. Uh, so we can anticipate it, but I think that's one of the uh, purposes of the big drug issue is order to write these laws so that they control innocent American people who would like to preserve their wealth. But they could clamp, they could do away with the dope trade pretty fast if they really clamp down on the big banks, but they're the head people in the power structure. Th that's right, but they're not likely to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, you've uh, taken a look at foreign investment in the United States. Some of those statistics, haven't you? It's startling when you, when you look at it all in one lump sum. Uh, Ron, you're from Houston, and there was a uh, story recently about Houston uh, prime real estate there being about 36 percent foreign owned uh, that occurred in USA Today a front page story uh, prime real estate in Los Angeles 49 percent 46 percent something like that foreign owned we're seeing uh, uh, investments every day, banks being bought, uh, commercial properties, farmland, and the article that I saw, there was a study released last month on it, that it's the foreign investment total in the United States now is in excess of $1.3 trillion and growing uh, at a tremendous rate. Uh, we call it the liquidation sale of America. <laughs> Why is it happening? Uh, there are several reasons why it's happening, but I think you know, a lot of those investments are made by uh, Japanese. Japanese investors. I think it's rather interesting to note that we had to fight a war not too many years ago with Japan. We, we thought we won the war, and now they own not only uh, a lot of Houston and Los Angeles, they own Waikiki Beach. They won, uh, uh, due to our bad policy, what they couldn't win in war. <clears throat> The main reason is it's, it's our sick currency. We have a balance of trade problem, but we compound it by literally exporting a lot of our money through foreign aid and military aid. So even Japan gets a benefit of about $50 billion a year by us paying for all their national defense. So we sort of subsidize them and uh, because we're less competitive and our interest rates are high. Uh, our interest rates are 8 and 9%. In Japan, they're 2 and 3%. Uh, labor costs are lower, so we can't compete anymore, and that's why we keep buying Japanese products. A lot of people say, well, the only solution is is to write a law and say that Americans can't buy a Japanese car and no foreign investors allowed to invest in this country. We as libertarians don't accept that. It's treating the symptom rather than the disease. The disease is a foreign policy where we subsidize these rich allies. At the same time, we have a currency that's weak, and we have economic conditions that have made us non-competitive. We don't want to take away the right of the individual to buy whatever product he wants, and we don't want to start some type of walling off of our country and saying nobody can come and go and people can't come in. I want a right to go out of the country and invest, and that means we have to allow somebody else to come in here and invest. So our solution is free markets, sound money, low interest rates, competitiveness, free market prices in labor, quit subsidizing Japan, a different foreign policy then I don't think we'd have to worry. We never had to worry about the foreigners buying up this country until recent times, until, <clears throat> until we got into these economic problems. But it's, it's curious, the people who say we shouldn't uh, uh, keep financing the defense of Western Europe and Japan, and yet it's those people who are buying American securities and financing our deficits. So they are the indirectly... The foreigners? Yeah, so they are indirectly uh, paying for their own defense. You know, there is, there's some truth to that, and uh, I think there's been a deal, too. I think that sometimes they're buying our debt when it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you have to think about, again, of this internationalism. Uh, they do this in order to maintain their order for their benefit. So even if it isn't to Japan's central bank's interest, you know, to buy our securities uh, for a strict economic, they might be able to buy somebody else's security and make more money. Uh, they might be able to buy a Swiss security. It might be a better deal. But if it's best for order, uh, in their eyes, I think, yes, they will. And indirectly, that is the case. So. I think long term, we can't pay this debt. So if we owe Japan a trillion dollars, if they bought a trillion dollars worth of our treasury bills, I think they're going to be left holding the bag. That's when I think the panic's going to come. When it finally dawns on them that they're holding a lot of lousy debt and they quit buying our debt, that'll be the precipitating event for the crisis. And that's when the, then the cartel, you know, this is a cartel of central banks, uh, and they're working pretty well together, and there's a lot of power there. But I think they'll finally break up their little cartel, and they'll get uh, a little bit antsy, and uh, they won't buy our debt, and then the panic will start. Isn't there a potential problem with the buying up of so much U.S. industry and banks and land? And that is, it's 
with ownership comes control and power. So are we, through letting them do this, actually giving the Japanese more and more power over our economic oh, and political so. system? That's why we should change our policy. That's why we should have sound money. I think it's very dangerous because uh, <clears throat> we literally will lose control. And uh, that's why I think it's urgent that we look to balancing a budget as quickly as possible and restoring sound money and changing our foreign policy. But the, if we're concerned, which I think everybody is, I don't think anybody is unconcerned. I think some people come up with different solutions, but I want to not deal with it in the narrow sense or probably writing some little rigid rule and say, well, I can solve this if we just keep Japan's cars out of here. We're going to solve our problem. It's not that easy. I mean, we have to look at the big picture of the economy, the monetary system, the deficits, uh, the whole thing put together in order to solve it. It means it's not easy. Well, thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you. And your, your background and insight. And uh, we all got to look for some place to go when that big crash occurs. I don't yeah. know where it's going to be, but... Uh, we got to prepare ourselves. Maybe we all got to start studying Japanese. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. Back when I was in high school and college, they'd always say, well... There are basically three types of liberal, uh, people, uh, political attitudes. There are the liberals who want to make changes. Then there are conservatives who want to keep the things the way they are. And then there are the reactionaries, and they want to go back and do away with all the things that have been built up in the present and go back to an earlier age. And so this term reactionary was used a lot, and it was, you know, a bad, bad name. Nobody wanted to be in a reactionary. This was a label that was penned on Goldwater, and one of the things, you know, contributing his demise, I'm sure, but they never say anything about Reagan being a reactionary, do they? And yet Reagan is exactly a uh, revolutionary reactionary. A new yeah. uh, category has to come in for uh, him. In <laughs> fact, the greatest distribution of wealth in American history took place under Ronald uh, Reagan. Literally billions of dollars were redistributed from the poor and the middle classes to the rich through Reagan's uh, tax bank program, his building up the arms industry, his government subsidized subsidies for different uh, corporations, etc., making class divisions much uh, greater under the Reagan administration than previously had ever happened in recent American uh, history. This really blows away the theory that liberals were advancing, that we're moving towards a classless society <laughs> in which class divisions between the rich and the poor are uh, disappearing in the uh, United States, at least during the Reagan administration. The uh, class differences have spectacularly uh, grown, as has the growth of a new underclass. I mean, there's even a worse situation than uh, poor working uh, people, and that is all the homeless, all of the uh, underclass that doesn't have any job, home, or even hope of any employment uh, whatsoever that has, again, mushroomed spectacularly under the Reagan administration, has visitors to any city in the United States can see. That's the end of another Alternative Views. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.